Hello everyone, welcome back to the uh, latest lecture session. In the last couple of sessions, we were discussing rather in detail, if I may say so, uh, coagulation and relevant aspects. And we looked at uh, lessening or decreasing this electrical double layer thickness by various ways. And one of the ways was charge neutralization and interparticle bridging. And the other one, uh, based on the type of coagulant you are adding, was sweep coagulation. So, in that context, we looked at interparticle bridging. I think there was a pretty good figure that we looked at. So, in general, you will also or you can add uh, polymers that can uh, lead to formation or lead to this kind of interparticle bridging, right. Let us uh, take this through. So, you have organic polymers that can be added. Organic polymers again, they are there are two kinds based on the type of uh, polymers. So, cationic, we know that the colloid is negatively charged. So, if you add a cationic polymer, cation meaning positively charged, what can it do? It can either neutralize after adsorption or also it can form a bridge. So, first it is going to adsorb and then neutralize depending on the charge and it can also form a bridge with respect to or with the other particle. So, you will have both neutralization and interparticle bridging. You can also have anionic polymers. There are also, you know, non-ionic polymers where the primary purpose is to act as uh, what do we say, bridging agent, if I may say so, or to promote interparticle bridging. Here we are looking at anionic polymers. So when can we use them? When we say that the other coagulant, let's say cationic polymer or any other cation itself, has been overdosed. You saw that, you know, with respect to electrophoretic mobility and such. If you overdose it, this is the picture. So, somewhere here is the sweet spot, right? And if you overdose it, then you have to bring down the charge, then again anionic polymers or such. Or you can also add them just for the bridging purposes, let us say. So, that is uh, the aspect that we need to discuss here. So, how do I know what is the dose to be added, right? For example, with respect to ferric hydroxide or aluminum hydroxide, we saw the relevant graphs. And we saw that, you know, at different regions as in different pH, different aluminum, different ferric iron concentrations, different types of iron or aluminum will predominate. So, how do I know in my, uh, what do we say, scenario, which one do I want or, you know, uh, which concentration do I want, whether I primarily want to go with sweep coagulation or will charge neutralization also play a role or such. Here it will depend on various factors, one NOM and other uh, species. So, analyzing what is there and such is remarkably difficult or not difficult, uh, time consuming and costly I guess that is the major aspect. So, we are going to conduct a simple test, right, how am I going to optimize the coagulant dose. So, we conduct a test which is called a jar test, let us see. Let us see how we will go about it. So, it is simple, I am going to take the sample. And here, what are the aspects of interest? We remember that pH plays a role uh, because depending on the pH, you can have the precipitation occurring or you can have different charge out there. So, you can uh, vary two primary variables. Uh, one is the charge, not charge, charge indirectly by the pH and also the coagulant dose. So, these are the two aspects you will check while conducting these jar tests in the lab. So, you will take the actual water and conduct the test, let us say. What are we trying to do? We are trying to simulate initially coagulation and then flocculation, let us say, right. So, let us uh, go forth. Here, we are looking at two aspects, coagulant dose and even mixing rate, but primarily for the jar test, we are looking at uh, coagulant dose, mixing rate and such will also depend upon the kind of mixer or impeller or such you are using in your particular system and the dimensions of your system and such. Uh, so, coagulant dose primarily. So, this is what it looks like, most UG labs would have had it. What do we have? We have this mixer, you know, that is dipped into this uh, solution, okay. Here you can see a clearer picture out here, it is a blade out here. So, what are, are you going to do? We are going to take the apparatus with the water or the sample that you want to conduct the test upon. So, three samples or six depends on the kind of uh, test, let us say, right. So, again, one thing is here people took the circular beakers. If I look at the plan view, this is the thing. But for greater turbulence, if you take square or rectangular ones, that is uh, better. But in general, these are difficult to maintain, easier to maintain. So, that is why people use the circular ones. That is something to keep in mind, right. 
So, you can see the flocks being formed and maybe later settling out. So, different stages of coagulation and flocculation. So, what is the procedure? Obviously, I want to you know test a range of doses with the different kinds of coagulants, right. So, then what do I need to do? I need to form what we say have coagulation. For this, I am going to mix it as in create considerable turbulence so that the coagulant mixes well with my uh, solution and will either adsorb and neutralize the charge or precipitate. Again, we will look at that later or have some interparticle bridging. But again, that is only initially. If you mix it too high, you know that again interparticle bridging will be affected. So, rapid mix for a small amount of time so that you have good mixing. And then you will go to slow mix. Why? You want to promote flocculation. If you continue with rapid mixing, the flocks are going to either shear or you have we looked at the issues with respect to the polymer you know binding itself with the same particle and such. So, we will have to look at slow mixing. Initially, we want coagulation occurring here and then during slow mixing flocculation. So, then we are going to let it settle down. What am I trying to do? Coagulation and flocculation and then settling right or sedimentation. This is what I am trying to simulate in the lab. So, then I will test the sample for turbidity and also pH because after addition of alum or some of the other coagulants you know that the pH will decrease. You want to see whether that pH uh, decrease is acceptable or not. So, thus you will measure pH. Turbidity is our primary aspect or concern as in we are trying to measure how much suspended solids we were able to uh, settle down. So, obviously, I will measure turbidity. In India, we do not do this, but if we are able to remove some natural organic matter which will affect the DBP formation potential that also you can measure. And volume of solids, how much volume of solids or such is produced, why? Because in the actual treatment plant, you will have sludge being settled down and that sludge you will have to take care of it again. So, you want to be able to calculate that. So, optimal coagulant dose and here the aspect is that it is not always the minimum. It is obviously balanced between practical aspects such as the costs and the final turbidity that you want to achieve let us say right. We are not looking at the ideal case scenario. So, that is one aspect to keep in mind. So, what do we have typically 6 beakers with the sample and then we are going to have rapid mixing right and then flocculation and uh, with uh, slow mixing yes and the kind of mixers are going to be the same throughout. We looked at the picture earlier identical paddle stirrers and in general by a single motor let us say right. So, what do we do in the first test? I am going to either change the pH or the dose. Typically, I will keep the pH constant and vary the dose. So, that is what we see. Okay. So, depending on it, people will go about it the other way, but typically if we look at the effect, it is always better to keep the pH constant and then look at the dose, but again different ways to go about it. So, then I am going to find the optimal pH and the coagulant dose. So, first people are looking at the pH and then using that optimum pH to find the optimum coagulant dose, right. So, let us see how we can go about it. So, we have a jar test here, we have the 6 samples and pH was varied from 5 to 7.5 and the alum dose was fixed at 10 milligram per liter. Obviously, trial and error initially too as in I am not obviously going to go to 2 acidic or 2 basic er, uh, pH. It will depend upon my objectives too at the end of the day and the cost of neutralizing this. Again, I am not going to release even if the turbidity is lowest here, I am not going to use that or probably might not. Why? Because to neutralize it, bring up the pH to 7, I need to add an AOH or such. Again, concentration, not concentration, costs are involved. So, these are the aspects to be mindful of and then alum dose is kept constant and then we are measuring the turbidity. You see that the turbidity well, decreases and then increases again here, right. So, here it is again a mix of uh, what is this optimum charge neutralization and sweep coagulation, maybe depending on the type of alum, but again here it is just alum, maybe less of interparticle bridging, let us see. So, what do we see? We see the effect of pH, and so you can choose either 6.5 or 6, and I think based on the data, we will choose 6. Okay, so based on the data, we are choosing a pH value of 6, let us see. And then you are going to choose that pH 6 and keep that constant across all your samples. 
Now you will conduct the test again at this pH across again 6 samples and now you are going to vary the alum dose 5, 7, 10 and so on let us see. Again trial and error is obviously involved and then I will get the residual turbidity. This is the turbidity of the solution that is remaining right and here we have the effect of alum dose at constant pH right. So, that is what you see out here and then we see that this is the profile from here you can choose the relevant concentration. But in general because the range is considerable what people will do is they will conduct a test again with uh, values chosen in this range let us see right. So, that you can get the accurate concentration you do not want to put in uh, too much alum right to be able to capture the most optimum one you will typically conduct the test right. So, we looked at this so it looks like pH 7 we already looked at that and people were choosing 12.5 but again as I mentioned in general you will conduct a test again let us see right and depending on your objective sometimes uh, you can even choose this after you choose this particular coagulant dose you can again conduct the effect on the pH as in is there a better pH let us see but again it obviously is slightly time consuming it is not a lot though it is pretty fast because we are only talking about a few seconds but for settling maybe a few minutes. So, it is not very time consuming but again in general if you repeat it it is going to be an issue. So, there is some trial and error involved and depending on how accurately you want to capture the effect of pH you can repeat it for pH but that is rarely done. So, rapid mix design right when I say rapid mix design what is it I am concerned with at least at our level. So, I want to promote mixing right how will I promote mixing I want to create turbulence turbulence meaning uh, if let us say you know water is flowing in this uh, direction let me put it down on the paper here. So, water is flowing in this direction and everything or if it is laminar flow right everything going at the same uh, velocity or such and then there is little to no mixing here right. But if I have different velocities or such yes in different directions and such I will have eddies being formed and then uh, mixing of uh, layers and such. So, I want to create this differential velocities or velocity gradients. So, if the water itself does not have uh, sufficient uh, gradient or turbulence what will I do I will create that. So, for example, think of it in your uh, home what do we do we turn on the fan. Similarly, you can have different types of mixers or impellers here. So, here there are two aspects let us say I am uh, a bit it is a bit sultry and I want to turn on the fan until I feel comfortable. So, two aspects either I increase the fan speed to the highest possible and feel comfortable in a relatively shorter amount of time or maybe at a lesser intensity for a, short, a longer period of time. But again it is not a straightforward analogy, but what I wanted to point out was the level or mixing intensity and the time or the duration for which you are going to mix uh, both play a role. Obviously, here we are limited by the kind of energy we want to impart. If you give too less an energy or uh, such at this point during coagulation, the system will not mix well. But again, what are we concerned with? Intensity of mixing and how long will you mix it? So, how is it that energy is transferred from the larger scale to the smallest scale? Let us see. Let me look at this figure that is present in, presented uh, in Crittenden et al. So, here I am going to start my motor. So, large scale action sets water in motion from my impellers or fans in the water. So, I am going to form eddies and this eddies lead to transport of uh, the energy right from one eddy to the other into smaller and smaller eddies let us see right. And here we see that there are two aspects macro scale and micro scale. We will come back to this earlier, but please do understand this figure. Here motion is turbulent right energy transport is due to inertial forces as in some water is uh, still others are uh, in motion right. So, you have inertial forces and at these influence the design of mixing device and level of energy input flock will break up. So, obviously here at this level flock will break up and then inertial sub range inertial sub range is not affected by the viscous forces at this influenced only by the level of energy input right. And then we come to the uh, smallest scale where at do not form right 
and here it is viscous energy dissipation let us say right. So, again uh, eddies transfer of energy let us say. So, that is one aspect to uh, keep in mind yes. Initially the large scale motion is relevant and later that large scale motion is not that relevant let us say yes. So, eddies in one region and no eddies but again micro scale mixing which is important for smaller particle and macro scale for the bigger particle. So, what is the goal? I want to quickly mix them so that the coagulants can destabilize the colloids effectively let us see right. So, we have different types. So, what do we have? One is the inline blender right that is what you see inline mechanical blender or also known as inline blender. So, you have water coming in and going out you can add a chemical feed ok chemical is being added from here and you have this propeller or impeller here let us see and you are going to have mixing in here. And next is inline mechanical again different types. So, we will not go into that in detail. Other one is static no moving parts that is obviously a relevant uh, advantage and thus no external energy source is required. Looking at the design you can see that the water mixes I guess right different elements dif differently sized elements from a few centimeters to uh, maybe even 100 centimeters but rarely I guess that is for industrial zones industrial types. So, this is static the earlier one obviously as you see was mechanical and we have another one stirred tanks. Well, it depends on the system depending on the space if you do not have space you will go for inline if you have space and depending on the level of control on the mixing maybe you will go for your stirred tanks. So, stirred tanks obviously so, flow is coming in and flow is going out what is it? It is a completely mixed flow reactor or a continuously stirred tank reactor and in general looks like we will promote sweep coagulation right. And here we will also have horizontal baffles to minimize short circuiting as in depending on where the water is coming in and where it is going out you do not want the water to take the shortish path you want it to be well mixed right. So, we want to prevent short circuiting that is why you have these baffles wall baffle walls I guess right. So, let me uh, see that ok here you have the baffle walls you have the mixers. So, chemical uh, addition is taking place at different stages and the water is coming in here and it is going out. So, it completely makes the system here right. So, let us move on again the types of uh, mixers here let us see right. So, mixing equipment consists obviously of a motor and speed reducer or regulator and either radial flow this is radial flow right think of this and this is axial flow right different depending on the type of uh, flow right radial flow or axial flow impeller. Again why is this relevant and such because depending on the relevant area here the and the uh, design you are going to have uh, what do we say shear forces being generated that lead to turbulence and such and obviously the energy that you are putting in through your motor for which you are paying will have to be able to do the job efficiently. So, that is where the design comes into play and we will look at this uh, soon ok. Primary design variables as I mentioned one is the how much time am I mixing it for. When I say time it obviously refers to the time that this water is spending in my system right. Time the water is spending in my system and we know that it is called the hydraulic retention time theta equal to V by Q you can calculate that pretty simply. And what is the other one? It is about the intensity of mixing right. Intensity of mixing how will I be able to achieve that? We know that we talked about you know different velocities or you know you want to have a gradient or difference in velocities at different levels that is when you will promote mixing let us say. So, that is what uh, we have out here. So, this is the figure let us say here there is 0 flow and after creating the right conditions I have this velocity gradient. So, here I am saying that the velocity gradient is dv by dy or let us say for the sake of uniformity in the case of other pictures let us say this is dv by dz. So, this is the mean velocity gradient what is the gradient in velocity here it is 0 and here the velocity is increasing. So, there is a gradient in velocity what is that or what is the variable it is g and it is called mean velocity gradient. So, it is in this direction that is what this is z I guess right. So, that is something to keep in mind the velocity is 0 here and it is increasing with uh, what do we say or increasing with z. So, let us see how to go about it Kriton and at all gives this. So, you have this particular uh, what do we say 
section if I may say so and here the velocity is V above we know that you know velocity is increasing as we are uh, going up. So, V plus delta V is out here. So, you are going to have force here let us see right and that force is again this is from Newtonian flow tau x y this is on this plane x y plane this is x and this y on this plane what is the force being applied tau x y into area right and that is going to be equal to this is from Newtonian flow mu dv by dz right how is the velocity changing and delta x delta y right we will look at it in a different way too but I wanted to uh, present this aspect here and power we know it is force into velocity power per volume so I want to calculate power per volume force into velocity volume is delta x delta y and delta z that is what we have force we just calculated that here force is what we calculated that from here and what is the velocity let us say at any particular height we know that the velocity gradient is dv by dz and at a particular height delta z it will depend upon the rate at which the velocity or the rate at which the velocity is changing with z so velocity is equal to dv by dz into delta z so if i simplify this looks like this is what i will get yes and please note that we said that this g is the mean velocity gradient mean velocity gradient so this is what we have here g let us see so what is the different way to so this will give me an idea about the level of mixing so a different way again this is from dr bachelor but the person who looked at it or presented this was dr camp so camp analysis we are assuming laminar flow conditions that is what we saw two slides before and we are assuming that the flat area let us say which was delta x or in the x y plane earlier is being pulled at a velocity v near a stationary surface and distance l away this is in the z direction and the viscosity is mu so under laminar flow conditions right it is under laminar flow conditions so what is f by a on that particular plate in the x y plane so it is similar to what we have what is f by a here f by a it is mu into dv by dz similar to what we had earlier so f equal to mu a dv by dz I am just presenting the previous information in a relatively uh, better manner which can be easily understood let us say right. So earlier a we took that to be delta x into uh, delta y right that is something to keep in mind and power consumption power is force times the velocity let us say and laminar flow what does that mean let us say here we saw that in the two uh, what we say graphs before velocity at this place is our location is 0 and it is increasing at what rate dv by dz so velocity at particular height l will be given by the rate of change of velocity with height into l let us say or dv by dz into l so from here I can calculate the power power equal to f into v that is equal to mu a dv by dz and thus so that is going to give me and I can transform this and from here I will get this g is equal to dv by dz that is equal to the square root of the power right that is where you are that is what you are imparting from your pump v is the volume of that particular uh, section and mu is the dynamic uh, viscosity of water right so that is something to keep in mind and how do I relate this to the different kinds of mixers or impellers out there we will look at that let us see so by impellers I am talking about these different kinds of impellers note that you know the angle there are different kinds for each one there is a power number keep that in mind and then the application is also uh, given here blending viscous liquids blending and maintaining suspensions and for flocculation and such let us say right so for blending it can be used for both blending or coagulation and flocculation this is what I am talking about when I say impellers so power number is given it is a constant for turbulent flow and the power consumed let us say which will depend upon or which can be related to power number right and thus we just saw it is uh, calculated by the relevant manufacturer it is going to be depend upon the power number the rotational speed as in how fast is it rotating right you have different impellers how fast is it rotating the diameter obviously of the impeller and the density of that particular water let us say so from that you will get the an idea about the power consumption that is uh, required let us say 
and then you can relate it to G and such. So inline mechanical mixing, we how do I do that? Either with an mechanical mixing or even static mixing, how do I get it? Uh, how do I relate this power, let's say, and G? How do I get that information? So we should understand that in line, we are going to have a head loss. And head loss is nothing but energy that's lost or dissipated per weight. And we know from Bernoulli's equation, head loss is equal to this, right? So P is pressure here, not uh, power. P here is pressure, right? Head and V square by 2G. And here I want to remove this weight term. So let's see how we can do that. Q into rho or, you know, I'm going to get Q rho G. This is what is this volume per time and mass per volume. So I'll get mass per time or weight per time, right? Because it's G, it's not mass, it's weight per time. That's what I'm going to calculate here. And now energy dissipation. So if I want energy dissipation, let's see, how will I get that? Which is P, this is power. Q rho G, which is weight per time, weight per time into energy that is dissipated per weight, which is head loss, right? So that's what we have, Q rho G into HL. So Q into this particular variable and HL, let's see, right? So from this, I will be able to calculate this. And I know that G is equal to square root of P by V mu. And I can get a relationship between G and the relevant aspects out here, let's see, right? So let me just erase this right? okay, from G, the level of mixing based on the uh, relevant head loss and the hydraulic retention time, right? So that's uh, something for you to look at because we know Q by V is equal to, uh, or V by Q is equal to theta, right? So again, we are looking at the power dissipation, let's say, right? I'm putting in power and I want to be able to understand how is it being dissipated and how much uh, level of mixing I'm going to get. So that's what we are trying to understand out here. So I'm uh, out of time. We will uh, continue the next aspects uh, in the next session. But what have we looked at until now? We have looked at different types of mixers and we know that how much time the water spends in the system is of primary importance, which is theta. And we also want to know how much turbulence it is or how much mixing we is needed. For that, what is the variable we are using? It's called G, mean velocity gradient. Velocity gradient meaning change in velocity, let's say. Right. So we were able to also then look at energy dissipation. How is this energy dissipation, you know, uh, relevant to either head loss or G? so that I can understand and uh, design accordingly. So with that, I will end today's uh, session. Thank you.